Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. Betty Wolf is an unusual singer-songwriter. She is using new technologies and existing technologies to represent her work as ceremony in a post-CD world. She'll be sharing details with us about an NFC card deck representing one of her albums to a golden coat crafted from the elements of her music. We also talk with her about her research project looking at music and its power for people living with dementia. She joined us at a fairly noisy cafe, so you can enjoy the real-life experience in the background here in Los Angeles at a fairly hip location. So here we're in beautiful Los Angeles. We've got great background noise here at was it Duse Machina, which is this very trendy, extremely trendy half bicycle shop, half coffee house. Absolutely. And you're here in Los Angeles, but your native home is normally London. In London itself. Yes, exactly. Heart of London. Heart of London. <laughs> So you seem to be an extreme both innovator and musician at the same time. How did you end up bringing technology and next generation technology into your performance and why is that important to you? Well, it really, for me it really begins um, sort of age eight and that was around the time that I first started writing songs. Uh, And for me it was this great love of storytelling and then realizing that you could put stories to music and they could reach more people. Um, And around that same time, I discovered records, vinyls, my parents' record collection. And I was totally hooked. I was completely obsessed with these musical books. That's how I saw them, you know, opening them up, reading the liner notes, um, looking at the artwork, and really immersing myself in that world of the artist. And that age I wasn't imagining what's my album gonna sound like you know when I'm older I was imagining what's it gonna feel like and what's it gonna look like and those were really important things to me so you know fast forward a good number of years and it's the time for my first album to be released and while I wanted to release it you know traditionally as a vinyl and And, and when was this what year so this was 2013 um, so summer of 2013 and obviously you you and I both know very different climate Um, you know we're kind of returning to the age of the vinyl yeah we are Um, but suddenly it's like you know it's streaming and it's iTunes and it's everything that has somehow removed that sort of physical quality um, that that tangibility and that um, also the ability for an album to tell something of a story. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm, I'm definitely embracing this new wave. You know, music can be shared all over the world. There are lots of wonderful things about, about the digital era. But I wanted to, you know, release it as a vinyl, release it as a lyric book, um, because I like the idea of songs being able to be read as poetry as well. Um, And then I also thought, well, how about trying to create something like a vinyl, but for the 21st century, some sort of digital vinyl. So this um, sort of led me to create what has been called the world's first 3D interactive album app, which is a bit of a mouthful. But essentially what it was is it was a digital vinyl for your iPhone or iPad. You had the liner notes, the artwork, um, you know, all of the lyrics, everything that you'd have in a record. But then you could slot your iPhone into this little Japanese um, sort of viewing platform and it turned your phone into a mini theater. And it felt like you had a performance in the palm of your hand. Um, so this was selling a physical item that went with your phone, so you're sort of a, uh, there was a physical good yes. that went with the digital good. Yeah, which was, you know, very cheap, I mean 15 bucks or something. Um, but it had this sort of transformative effect and it really captured people's imaginations. Um, so this, I guess, you know, that was my first... Um, that was my first dive into the world of really using technology you know, in and around my music. And that, the response that I got from that just encouraged that, that excitement and that passion. Now, what is the genre space that you perform in? Now, I'm a singer-songwriter. The music's very lyrical. It's quite 
folky, it's quite rocky, it's quite pop. There's some R&B in there. You know, I guess it's the kind of music that genre-wise can be a bit fluid, um, but it's very poetical. I play with a, a double bass player and a, and a sort of Motown drummer. But it's not necessarily a sort of tech-oriented crowd who might be your audience. It's regular, wonderful people. Absolutely. It's very classic in, in, in the sense of not classical, but classic. Um, classic ap approach to, you know, songwriting. So I know you've done a lot of great things since then. Let's back up. So before that, you were saying something about music and dementia that you were taking a look at before this. Sure. So the the rather long story into my childhood, um, the you know the sort of underlying message is that I started using technology as a way of reintroducing tangibility, storytelling, and ceremony. So for me, it was actually those almost traditional qualities that you know listening to a vinyl had. I wanted to make them relevant and exciting again for today's generation by using technology. So just to, just to sort of make that clear. And you know that really it's that sense of ceremony which I feel very strongly about because when you put on a record, you know, you make time for it. You're sitting there, you might pour yourself some scotch uh, or whiskey and and it's, you know, it's got a central focus, whereas the way we listen to music now is it's this sort of 24 hour a day, uh, 24 hour seven streaming process, you know, where we don't, you know, we don't really know what we're listening to and it's on in the background. And I think it's about just bringing it, you know, to the foreground again. But you had previously been looking at dementia and music. Um, so the dementia and music side which is a sort of you know it's a whole other um, track in some ways that almost relates to you know I've always had these three sort of core motivations the first is being of service in some capacity the second is the importance of one's intention behind everything that you do and the third is keeping the parameters open to whatever inspires you so obviously the you know the power of music and dementia project that does fall more into that service space but it was never a conscious decision to create a philanthropic project to tick that box it was really born out of a you know a deep love and respect for the work that Oliver Sacks had done and many other neurologists um, and you know music therapists in that area and you know reading musicophilia this sort of compendium of case studies that look at how music can help people with a range of ailments um, and being you know sort of so deeply moved by that not thinking for one second I would ever do anything in that field you know myself um, but then finding out that my grandmother had been diagnosed with dementia um, and she was based in San Diego and I thought okay well whenever I'm over in the States on regular shows I'll you know, I'll make a beeline and I'll go and perform to her. And I would arrive and, you know, she'd be very confused and very disengaged and wouldn't know who I was. And after one or two songs, it was like, you know, light bulb on, back in the room, uh, back to her former self. And, you know, sort of really remembering things that predated, you know, sort of much earlier memories that were even before my time. And I was amazed because the... A lot of you know a lot of the studies that I'd read were looking primarily at familiar music. So they were looking at you know music that was sort of deeply ingrained in someone's personal or you know autobiography. And those songs that they'd grown up with would be sort of trigger points. Um, and I was thinking, well, yeah, my grandmother's heard my music in the last year of her life, but it doesn't go doesn't go back you know in time. So that experience, you know, it was, it was interesting for me. And then I decided to perform to a relative living in a care home in Portugal. And he had advanced stages of dementia. And what was meant to be a performance to just this one relative ended up being to the entire ward. So 150 re residents, patients. And none of them had heard my music before. And none of them actually spoke any English apart from this one relative. And I thought, OK, at best, you know, it's going to be a nice ambience. It's going to be just sort of, it can't do any harm. But I wasn't expecting 
to see what we saw. You know, so people that had that were asleep, waking up and singing along to these songs they'd never heard and clapping and engaging with with one another. And at the end of the performance, the director of the care home said, you know, in the 10 years I've been here, this is the best I've ever seen the group. So I came back to London and I was sort of thinking, wow, I feel like this isn't the end of this. You know, I feel like I don't just want to have a story to tell people. I don't want to try and convince them of, you know, some of the things that I, I we'd seen. Um, I want to have something that's a bit more robust. So I teamed up with a, a foundation called the Utley Foundation with the former marketing director of HSBC, the Priory Care Group and 2020 Research. And we did a four month research tour where I performed in care homes all across the UK. Um, you know, a 30 minute set of original music and the residents were monitored during the live performance but then also in the weeks following as they listened to the same songs on headsets and we you know we I saw some of the most amazing responses to music I've ever seen one gentleman called David who was virtually you know comatose and his family had stopped visiting because it was just too upsetting the carers desperately wanted to get a photograph or a you know film something of a smile like something that um they could send to the family to say, look, he's still here, he's still with us. And at the start of you know, the performance, when I was tuning up, he was totally asleep. No, you know, nothing could rouse him. And within maybe the first few bars of the first song, his arm starts to move. And it's in perfect time to the music. And then it gets more and more energetic and his eyes go wide. And then in a later song in the set, he gets up and he dances. Oh, wow. And the carers end up, you know, sending home to his family a, a video of him dancing. Um, I mean, what better response is, is there than that? And, you know, then there's this woman, Anne, who hasn't spoken in almost a year. And the last time she said anything was when the carers were giving a, a deep hand massage. And she starts, you know, singing along to these songs um, she's never heard with sort of huge amounts of enthusiasm and this was all documented you know so it was it was so wonderful to also be able to capture that um, but then in the weeks afterwards as people were listening to the you know the same songs on headsets we saw you know a 72 percent improvement in memory and communication over this four month period so there was some it wasn't just improving the quality of life in the moment, there was actually some real benefits. So from there, you know, the report comes out and it goes straight into the Times, page three. This is the first study of its kind and this is profound. And then, you know, a lot of the broadsheets in the UK, the Independent and um, Guardian, they all start writing about it. BBC Radio 4, which is kind of like the M NPR, do this extended segment and I'm just thinking oh my god what's <laughs> what is going on <laughs> this was last year so this was um, 2015 um, and I you know as I'm going off to do various shows or keynotes and talking about musical innovations and my musical jacket which I will get to um, and you know other varieties in that vein of sort of what is the vinyl for the 21st century I also want to share this dementia story, even though it's not, you know, the conventional story you'd be sharing in those sort of cool arenas. Um, but it's just amazing to see how, how many people are responding and how many people want to support. So then I get an email from Stanford, you know, saying, will you come in and, and, and see us? This is Stanford's research department. And I'm sort of looking down the list of the people that will be in this meeting thinking oh my god this is you know director of Alzheimer's research and head of neurology and or whatever their titles were I was absolutely terrified I was thinking these people are going to tear my study to pieces <laughs> and that was 100% what I you know what I thought would occur and I went into this meeting and you know instead they said look this is truly exciting we've never seen any any piece of research that's looked at music that is entirely new to those individuals and we love the fact that there's a positive approach you know we only know in this field the language of, of difficulty and burden you know it's always about 
how you relieve the burden of dementia and who wants to talk about that who wants to hear that but you've come in from this sort of celebrating the the positive connections that music can facilitate and it's a totally different approach and so you know they they asked if if they could extend the research and turn it into a you know a Stanford piece of research so that's excellent that's sort of where we are now. That's something, as we were commenting before we started this, that uh, UCLA is part of the UCMRC project, and there's other researchers also starting in similar paths or on similar paths, looking at Alzheimer's and dementia and pediatric cancer care and other interesting areas. So this is one of our areas, actually, as a center that we're extremely excited about, is, is making a difference in people's lives in, in the health side of music. But you've been really doing a lot more uh, since you put the first piece back in 2013 together out of digitally enabled next generation album and then you've been on the really fabulous it sounds like a uh, magical mystery tour of getting out to whether it's Bell Labs or Apple or the, can you talk about how your journey continued and your jacket yeah I have to say I've been calling the jacket tour the musical magical mystery tour so I, I really like that that's how you refer to it and yes, so I guess um, the musical jacket was for me the most extreme example of really bringing, you know, tangi tangibility, storytelling, and ceremony back to music. So that was almost an overt example because it's one of one. It's you know going to be in the V&A and the Museum of Fine Art in Boston and a few other galleries, but it's not that accessible, um, which is why we created a counterpart to it. But I'll start with the musical jacket because the story is wonderful. And the way it came about, um, actually, it re you know the start of the story is at the Royal Albert Hall for a night of Michael Caine with um, the tailor who dressed James Bond. And it doesn't really get more British than that. I mean, that's just a, that's a very typical night out if you're a Londoner. Um, so I'm with, you know, this tailor who, um, who did all of sort of Sean Connery's suits and this wonderful Savile Row tailor. And he's telling me that actually some of his clients also include uh, Bowie and Hendrix and Jagger under this moniker of Mr. Fish and I'm sort of you know fascinated by this so the man who sold the world that cover where um, Bowie is lying on a chaise lounge that's a Mr. Fish and all of you know um, Jimi Hendrix's shirts Jagger's sort of dress shirt that he wore for his comeback gig at Hyde Park and then also Muhammad Ali's Rumble in the Jungle Gown. So all these wonderfully sort of eccentric, you know, 1960s and 70s designs. And he hasn't made anything since then. So he'd had something of a, of a sort of um, quiet time while all the James Bond stuff was happening. Then in the next sentence, he tells me, oh, and by the way, I've just moved into the first home of Yoko and, uh, and Lennon, and you should come over and visit because there's actually a connection with Yoko with my 3D interactive album app, which is that I was sharing design teams with her. And so they were able to test out a lot of technology they were developing for her, but on me, which is why it was sort of so cutting edge. So, of course, I jump at the opportunity to go around for tea at their first home and go over. It's a place called 34 Montague Square. And I um, turn up thinking that this is Yoko and Lennon's home only, you know, that only those two ever lived there. And what I discover is this sort of musical and cultural heritage that is on a par with Abbey Road, pretty much. And I'm, so I'm sitting in the front room and I'm waiting for my cup of tea and I see this series of black and white pictures behind me of Ringo drumming in that room and uh, McCartney with his guitar and Hendrix looking incredibly cool, lounging around, putting on records uh, and Yoko and Lennon, you know, naked. And the tailor comes back in and I'm like, what is this place? This is, you know, you have to tell me the story. So he says, okay, well, 50 years ago this year, so this was 
2015, Ringo bought the house and it was his sort of secret drumming rehearsal room because it was close to Abbey Road. He then leases it to McCartney, who writes Eleanor Rigby in this room that we're sitting in, and also uses it as his Zapple HQ, where he records, you know, William Burroughs and all these other beat poets. Um, Hendrix comes over from the States and needs somewhere to live, and McCartney's like, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, move in with Heather, so you can, you can come and live here. So Hendrix moves in, and he has this partner whose middle name is Mary, um, and she hates being called Mary. Uh, and one night they have this sort of tempestuous argument and she storms off and he writes and records The Wind Cries Mary in that room. He then gets evicted for whitewashing the walls when he's high on acid. So Ringo's like, you know, sorry, see you later. And Yoko and Lennon move in and restore the piece and sort of famously get naked for the first time for their Double Virgins album. So I'm, you know, sitting there taking this all in. <laughs> but talking to a tailor at the same time. Ta talking to a tailor. And in this place that, you know, has been privately owned since that period. So no one has recorded in there. You know, barely anyone's visited the room. And all I'm imagining as a musician is how do I record my album single or my album in this room? But I also feel that there's something more we can do here. I feel there's a story, you know, the fact that the tailor dressed a lot of those musicians and he hasn't made anything in a while. And, you know, there was this sort of story brewing. And then later that week, I was at a friend's book launch for a book called Digital Handmade, which is about celebrating artisans that are working in a digital sphere. And who's the author there? Uh, Lucy Johnson. And I meet one artist that evening who essentially tells me that she converts music into fabric. So I'm trying to get my head around this, and there's this wonderful sort of gold, silver armchair on a plinth that's next to us. And I say, sorry, you know, I have to stop you. Is this armchair one of your you know, pieces of, uh, of work? And she says, yes, this is the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds armchair. So. The idea is that you know she decodes the recording and then weaves um, you know weaves the fabric with the geometric patterning of the song, and it's completely beautiful um, and you know magical. And suddenly this story that's been sort of forming in my head is complete. And the idea is that we record the album single live in that room where McCartney wrote Eleanor Rigby, where Hendrix wrote The Wind Cries Mary, to an audience of the founding fathers of British rock journalism. Um, and that live recording, sort of complete with all the ambient sound and the resonance of that room, is then translated into this wonderful gold fabric um, with the geometric patterning of the recording woven into it. And it's cut by the tailor who dressed Hendrix and Jagger and Bowie into the first musical jacket of its kind and the first bespoke piece of fashion that he designed since that golden period. And then just to give it a, a little tech edge, we also put NFC chips into the fabric so you can tap the jacket um, to hear the song that's woven into it, which is a line I use. So the, the line at the end of some some of these performances is, you know, guys, I give you full, um, you know, you have, you can tap me if you want to, um, and people seem to find that very funny. You know, as I said, that for me, that it's this sort of synthesis of, um, you know, of history and art and music and technology and um, fashion and I also like to think of it as a truly tailored album release for the 21st century. And so can f can extreme fans buy a copy of the jacket? No, so the jacket is is one of one, it is either on me or it will be in a in a gallery but the idea as I said was to make something that was accessible to everyone, that was almost like that 3D interactive album app, you know, that people could sort of experience and get something of the tangibility, you know, of the album as well. So as well as being released as the rather off the cuff musical jacket, Montague Square was also released as the world's first 
album deck of NFC cards. Oh, um, okay. Which she's holding out and showing to me here as we're sitting in this beautiful little cafe outdoors. Yes, and so, you know, as you can see, it looks a bit like a tape. Um, and you've got, you know, the track. A very cute pack of gum. A very yeah. cute, cute pack of gum. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, you can keep it in your pocket. It's very sort of easily, you know, transportable. And it has the track listings. It has sort of the vital information of the album. And then the best way of doing that is, yeah, you can do it like this as well. And then you open it up and you've got you know, a card for each song from the album. And the card is printed with the lyrics, with the artwork for that track. Um, you then tap that individual sort of song card onto your phone and you can hear the music, you can watch the music video for that song. You've got all the content related to that track. And it's and it's one card per, and this is a, these are Moo cards, but these are specialized Moo cards. Yes. So this, we did, it was a collaboration with Moo and they just announced the way I'll, it's quite a succinct story, but the way that this came about, so I was with the CEO of Moo um, in 2015, sort of summer of 2015, and he showed me this, this sort of collection box that they designed for Art Basel that was very beautiful. And it had a you know, 10 slides, and each slide corresponded to a painting from the collection. And then 10 minutes later, he was saying, oh, and we're just about to announce our NFC-enabled business cards. So I sort of thought, well, why wouldn't you combine the two and why wouldn't you have the best of that print world, you know, create something that's really beautiful that you can give as a gift, but it's also enhanced by the immediacy that digital brings. So that's how... And, and each deck. one, somewhat, somewhat glorious of the Moo environment is every card has a different graphic on the back, which they're extremely strong to do when you're getting a set of traditional cards. This carries for us their strength. Exactly. So so if you just tap it, um, there you hear the tap, everyone. <laughs> um, and now that is taking you through to um, the track, the the track page for "Take Me Home." So "Take Me Home" was the song that became the musical jacket. Um, so there you've got uh, the song, you've got the lyrics, the music video which is also a sort of documentary video of how it was made. And the lovely thing is, you know, the content is, is fluid, so you can constantly be updating it. And those fans, you know, the people with that p pack of cards are discovering new things all the time. And able to share them with other people. Exactly. Which you can't necessarily do with any kind of streaming or digital download that easily. So excellent. So this has also then gotten you in lots of speaking and conversations about your perspective or is it the fact that people want to hear a different way to do this or you're sparking the imagination of some of these technology companies? I guess uh, I guess a combination of um, everything. I think it's, it's that seeing music differently, those three words which seem to tie everything all together and whether that's you know seeing music for for healing but in a sort of entrepreneurial sense as a, and a social entrepreneurial sense as opposed to maybe you know being a charity or being a non-for-profit because of, I'm obviously neither of those things through to then you know seeing how we can just almost fill that space somehow between the streaming and the vinyl so it's wonderful that vinyl is still around and it's making a comeback but I think it's also finding a way that people can listen to music on the go in, you know, in different environments, um, in ways that are sort of more, you know, user friendly, but they don't have to lose all of the things that they love about, you know, putting on a record. Now, a lot of other artists are looking for new solutions. Was this hard? Was the, is there a reason that you are the one to bring this to the table versus Moo or whoever it is talking to somebody else about is it that you're seeing opportunity differently and do you think this is open opportunities for other artists or is there sort of friction to try to put new technologies into an art artistic space um i guess i guess maybe it's because you know at the end of the day i'm i'm not a um you know i'm not a neurologist i'm not a total tech geek you know I'm, I'm very techie but really I'm a music lover I'm a deeply passionate music lover and everything that I do 
is influenced by you know how do we you know how do we create more meaningful experiences around music whether that's making people dance if they were previously sort of catatonic or just making us more mindful about you know how and, and what we're listening to um, so maybe it's coming from that angle as opposed to just how do you weave technology into everything because I think nothing should ever be created from the outside in you always have to know why you're doing it otherwise it could be a gimmick so every time you know I've when I, you know, when I released the 3D interactive album app, and people were asking me, "Oh, what are you going to do for album number two? I had no answers. I wasn't even particularly thinking I'd do anything that out there. Um, you know, the combination of sort of serendipity and and keeping the parameters open. So being in a in a state of mind that allows you to sort of see an opportunity and be inspired, and sometimes change your plan. You know. Um, and then realize that you have to record an album pretty quickly to, you know, to make this all come together. Yeah, make this all come together. So, so I can't really ask you what you're doing on your next album that's going to surpass or uh, adhere to these uh, great ideas that you've done? Um, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you're, you're constantly traveling now, both performing and this has given you additional visibility as an artist? Yes. Um, so, you know, you mentioned the keynotes. You know, there have been there have been a lot of really interesting opportunities to sort of share what I'm doing in different forums, whether it's, you know, Wired through to Apple HQ and Cupertino, through to sort of innov social innovation summits in Silicon Valley. And it's amazing how much of that strikes a chord, even with the people that are sort of somewhat responsible for breaking up the album as a format in the first place. Um, so I feel like it, it really is, we, we do crave, uh, you know, a lot of this sort of more tangible and more uh, experiential way of listening to music. Um, what would you see as the next technology you'd, you'd want to play with or that you wish you'd seen already? Anything that is sort of a new magical mystery to a concept of something else that you would love to play with that you don't see yet? Well, I, so I just had the experience um, of doing the first artist show with Bell Labs, um, with their new human digital orchestra that uh, is this amazing platform that sort of allows the audience to become a participant in that live performance. Um, and we had very little time to pull it all together. So again, classic case of that wasn't or originally in my plan for the year, um, but the president calls me up. He mentions how many Nobel Prizes and Grammys and Oscars and the Turing Award um, that they've you know, accumulated over the years. And he asked if I'll do this show um, you know, in next to no time. I think this was only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and most people would probably freak out and, and think, no, 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 well, that's not in the month of May's plan um, but instead I, I of course um, jumped to that opportunity um, and so there we had you know very little time the the actual parameters of what was possible were sort of wide open um, and one of the lines that he used which I loved was you know whatever you can imagine we can create um, so I would definitely like to explore more of what the Human Digital Orchestra can do. The performance in New York at this festival was hugely successful, um, but it's almost like we got to try out a few of the colors and there were, there were, there were quite a few more colors on that palette that I'd like to experiment with. So we're about to the end of our conversation. It's been really marvelous <laughs> talking with you. I feel we could probably talk for a couple more hours. What might be a, a last word or two that you want to make sure that people would think about when it comes to innovating around the music space? Um, make sure you know why you're doing it. Um, I think the why is the single most important thing. Um, and it goes back to that idea of what is your intention? Because intention is key. Thank you very much. Thank and if you. someone wants to find your work, they're going to find it on your website? Yes. Uh, so it's btwolf.com. So that's 
B-E-A-T-I-E-W-O-L-F-E dot com. And we're in the middle right now recording this in 2016. You're going to be touring all over the place, I take it? Yes. So uh, European tour coming up, um, UK tour when I get back uh, on Thursday, and uh, lots more appearances in the States. Excellent. Well, we look forward to seeing all your exciting new adventures and whatever you cook up next. Awesome. So, thanks Thank for joining you. us. <laughs> Want to hear more from Beatty? You can track her music down, Montague Square, at BeattyWolf.com, including digital tracks, her limited edition lyric book, and is a pioneering album deck of NFC cards. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at innovation.schoolofmusic.ucla.edu. Join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music. Thanks again.